Our text this morning is Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. <clears throat> Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Mm. His people are those he elected before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> his people does not just mean the Jews. For if that were true, only Jews could be saved. I want to speak this morning on the atonement that God made for His people. And our subject is the un... Our subject is the limited atonement versus the unlimited atonement. You have probably heard all of your life that Jesus died and made an atonement for every person that ever lived. This is simply not true. This is not what the Bible teaches. I realize that most people have been programmed to believe that statement that Jesus died for all men everywhere. And it may be new to you to hear this message that Jesus died only for His people. But I believe that is what the Bible teaches. Now those who teach an unlimited universal atonement face an insurmountable difficulty because it logically leads to universal salvation. They don't want to go that far. But you can't camp at a halfway house. If you take a universal atonement, then you have to accept universal salvation. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, beginning with verse 8, the scripture declares that we are reconciled to God in the atonement by the death of His Son. Let me read that. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. <clears throat> if Christ died for all, then all would be saved. But since all are not saved, therefore Christ did not die for all. The Armenian view of a universal atonement is impaled on the horns of a dilemma. He cannot stop at the halfway house. He must logically accept universal salvation. And of course, he doesn't want to do that, so he tries to pause midway between these two horns of the dilemma. And he cannot do that. If you believe that Jesus died and made an atonement for the sins of all men everywhere in all time, then you must also believe according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, that Jesus died for all men and that all men will be saved because the Bible teaches that whom He died for, He saves. He saves all those He died for. Now if He died for all men, then all men will be saved and that's universalism. And He doesn't quite want to go that far. But he's got a problem because logic tells you that if he died for all men, then all men will be saved because Romans 5.10 says we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Mm. His son died 2,000 years ago. And when he died on the cross, he died an atoning sacrifice. And by that atoning sacrifice, he procured the salvation of all His people. And therefore, there is further trouble for the Armenian view 
because multitudes were already perished and in hell before Jesus ever came and died upon the cross. So how are they going to reconcile the destruction and the death of those before the cross of Christ when those people died and went to hell? How will He reconcile a universal atonement with the fact that they perished? Because I will tell you this morning, that no person that Jesus died for will ever go to hell. And when you hear these <clears throat> preachers talk about people going to hell that Jesus died for, they don't understand salvation. They don't understand the Scripture. No one will ever go to hell that Jesus died for. If Jesus died for you, you will never go to hell. And there were multitudes in hell before Jesus ever died upon the cross. So He could not have made an atonement for them. They were already perished and lost and gone. The antediluvian world in Noah's day, they, they tell us now that it is believed that it was a vast population, perhaps in the millions of people, and all of those people perished with the exception of eight people. Noah and his sons and their wives. And when God built the ark, He built it for eight inhabitants plus the animals. If He had in mind the intention of an atonement to save all of that antediluvian world, He would have built the ark large enough to save all those people. And he constructed the ark just exactly so that it fit all the animals, two of each kind, and Noah and his family, and no one else. Even in typology, such as the ark, you have an incongruity when people say that he died for everyone. Spurgeon said, I would rather trust a narrow bridge that goes all the way across to the other side than a wide bridge that only goes halfway across. The question, was the atoning death of Christ actual or hypothetical? Does it save the sinner or just make him savable? Just making it possible for him to be saved. Was it theoretical? Or was it a real atonement? We are saved by a real atonement. It was not a hypothetical atonement. It was not a, an atonement that's dependent upon what man does. It's an atonement that was made for a people and for those people for whom He died, He will invariably save every one of them. There are only two positions that one can take in this matter of the atonement and its extent. First of all, there's the Armenian view, and this is actually what they're teaching. That Christ died equally for all, but actually securing the salvation of no one in particular. But making salvation possible for all equally. In other words... <clears throat> Jesus didn't really die and save you by His death. He just made it possible, they say, that you could be saved by the certain things that they say you have to do. That is, that He died only potentially to make salvation possible. They say He died on the cross, but He actually did nothing for anybody. Now, if... They can have that kind of an atonement. I wouldn't want it. An atonement that leaves it up to me to save myself is actually what they're teaching. But the atonement that Jesus made according to the Scriptures was to save His people from their sins. And that's what He did. All of you here that are saved, did He just make it possible for you to be saved? Or did He save you? I think He saved you. Now, 
I don't believe in an atonement that puts it back in my hands. Hmm. Because when you study the inability of man, as the Bible so teaches, you find that man is unable to do anything for himself. He cannot repent. He cannot have faith. He cannot come to Christ. Actually, he can't do anything in the spiritual realm because he's dead in trespasses and in sins. And if God only made it possible for us to be saved, and then it was up to us to make that salvation a reality, then none of us would ever be saved. Mm. None of us would ever be saved. So what they have in their hypothetical atonement is a satisfaction that does not satisfy. They have a redemption that does not redeem. They have a propitiation that does not propitiate. And they have a reconciliation that does not reconcile. The scriptural teaching of the Bible is that God sent His Son to save His people, not to put them in a redeemable position. Redemption was an actuality, not a potentiality. God's purpose was to redeem and reconcile a chosen elect people. Actually, the issue is not so much whom did Christ die for? But what did Christ do on the cross? He did five things on the cross. First of all, when He made His atonement on the cross, He died as a sacrifice for our sins. When the worshiper in the Old Testament came with his sacrifice, he had to lay his hands on the head of the sacrifice symbolically his sins were then transferred to the sacrifice. The sacrifice then had to die. And Jesus on the cross was the sacrifice for our sins. Secondly, He propitiated God. That is, He appeased the wrath of God that we deserved. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. In 1 John 4.10, Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and mm. sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's wrath remains upon the unbelievers. But our case was propitiated by the Lord Jesus Christ. He made an actual propitiation which turned away the wrath of God from His people. Thirdly, He redeemed us from our sins. Redemption is a term taken from the marketplace. It was a ransom. And Jesus paid the ransom. Christ died in the place of His chosen people, laid His life down for the sheep, and paid the ransom price to redeem us from sin. Now the nature of a ransom is such that it automatically frees the persons for whom it was intended when it is accepted. He reconciled us forthwith. The atoning death of Christ is called a reconciliation. Reconciliation is a finished work. What did Jesus say when He died upon the cross? He cried out, Tickle stay Aya, it is finished. What He meant is, I have finished the work of redemption for my people. For those that the Lord Father gave to me, I have lost none. I have finished the work. If the work is finished, there's nothing for us to do. He finished the work on the cross. And we receive it by faith. There isn't any works that man has to do in order to be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. So reconciliation is a finished work. 
An actual reconciliation was effected when Jesus died upon the cross. And the plain declaration of scriptures says that God has been reconciled to us by Christ. The time that it was done and what was done uh, at that time shows us that. Let me give you Romans 5.10 again and think about it carefully. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Now when were we reconciled? While we were enemies, we were reconciled. Not made reconcilable, but reconciled. Mm -hmm. Through the death, not through our walking down the aisle or shaking the preacher's hand, not through our this and that and the other, but through the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. If you ever get hold of Romans 5.10, you'll never doubt again that Christ had made a reconciliation for you with the Father. The application of salvation follows this reconciliation. And in that death, an actual reconciliation was consequently secured for you. In the fifth thing that he did, Christ's death was a substitution. His death was vicarious. Now the word vicar is a word that stands in the place of another. So Christ is our vicar. He stood in our place. He bore our judgment. He took the death that we should have died. He took the judgment that we deserve. He took the place of ourselves, our, His people, when He died upon the cross. And from the fact that Christ made an atonement for all those that He saves, means the atonement puts away their sins. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6 but he was wounded for our transgressions. Notice the word our. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. We'll find out in just a moment who the our is. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Us. Why did he put an us in front of all? Because he's talking about a particular people that he died for. He died for if he died for the sins of all, then he paid for the sins of all, which he did not do, because there are people who have died and gone to hell. So he couldn't have paid for their sins. If he had paid for their sins, they wouldn't have gone to hell. And so it's very simple when you think it through. But Ephesians 2, 3 says they are children of wrath. General redemptionists are forced to believe that the sinner who dies cursing God had an atonement made for his sins. How could that be? How could a blasphemous, unsaved sinner <coughs> dying in his sins, cursing God, how could he possibly have had an atonement made for his sin? If Jesus made an atonement for him, he wouldn't die and go to hell and he wouldn't be blaspheming God. Ephesians 2.3 says they're children of wrath, not children of God. Then in the Passover, that night in Egypt, when God passed over the land of Egypt, He had in mind the redemption of His people Israel. And He said, You put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, and when I pass over the land of Egypt this night, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and there will be no death in your homes. But where there is no blood applied, there will be the death of the firstborn of every family. And that night God passed over the land of Egypt in judgment. And wherever the blood of His sacrifice, sacrifice was placed on the doorpost, He passed over in judgment. 
And the blood averted the judgment of God. And so today the blood of Christ averts the judgment of God from His people. And the Passover is a type of the atonement according to 1 Corinthians 5, 7. And the atonement that was made by blood was not made for Egypt. There was not one Egyptian that had an atonement made for him. There was not one Egyptian that placed blood on the doorpost. And that night, the firstborn of every Egyptian family died without an atonement. The atonement was made by blood for the people of Israel, for God's people, and no one else. Every home in Egypt lost their firstborn son. And then Jesus himself limited the atonement. He said in John chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 11, verse 15, and verse 26, that the atonement was limited. Let me read it to you. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. There, the atonement is limited to the sheep. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Then in verse 26, he said, But ye believe not, because you are not of my sheep. Why don't they believe? Because they're not his sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now Jesus three times in these few passages said he laid his life down for the sheep. And then that word for is from the Greek word huper, H-U-P-E-R, and it means on behalf of. I lay down my life on behalf of the sheep. The, the sheep are those the Father gave to him. Jesus said, I died for the sheep. Verse 11, 15, and 26. And then in verse 26, he said to those Pharisees, Ye are not my sheep. In other words, he plainly tells them that he did not die for them. He's not going to make an atonement for them on the cross. You are not my sheep, he said. But I lay down my life for the sheep, for my sheep. So, if he lays his life down for the sheep and they were not his sheep, then certainly he did not make an atonement for them. And he did not. Did you know there are two kinds of people in this world? Sheep and goats. Let me read that to you. Jesus himself said it. Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them, verse 34, on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So here Jesus says there are two kinds of people, sheep and goats. He'll set the sheep on his right hand. He'll set the goats on his left hand. He'll bring the sheep into his everlasting kingdom and he will send the goats into everlasting eternal punishment. Everlasting fire, he calls it. 
So here Jesus himself taught a limited atonement and taught that only those that he died for would be saved. Now it's also limited because Jesus is a surety for his people. Jesus took our penalty and paid our debt upon the cross of Calvary. He did that at the cross. It could not have been for all because all are not saved. It's that very simple. If he died for all, all would be saved because his death, Romans 5.10, his death was an atonement for the sins of his people. If he made an atonement for everyone, everyone would be saved. But he said himself that he laid his life down, that's his death, for the sheep and for the sheep alone. And then he singled out some people and said, you're not my sheep. He's saying in effect, I did not die for you. And that's why he says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would believe. Do you remember the story when Jacob and his sons were sending the boys down into Egypt to get corn? And the eleven brothers were going to go. And Jacob didn't want Benjamin to go because Benjamin was his beloved, his youngest son. And he had already lost, he thought, Joseph. And now if they go down there and if they fail to bring Benjamin back, it would break his heart and he would die. And Judah intercedes and Judah says, Listen, I'll be a surety for Benjamin. I'll take Benjamin's place if I don't bring him back. Genesis 43, 9. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require it. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. Judah says, listen, Father, don't worry. I'll be a surety for Benjamin. And if they try to hold Benjamin, I'll let them hold me in Benjamin's place. I'll be a substitute. I'll be a surety for Benjamin. Then in Genesis 44, 32, for thy servant, he's now talking to the authorities, Joseph, in Egypt. And they're telling him they're going to hold Benjamin. And he says, I became a surety for Benjamin. And if I don't take Benjamin back, my own father will die. It will break his heart. So I am a surety. Take me and let the lad go back. In other words, here am I. You can take me and if you're going to kill the lad, kill me. Let the lad go. I'll be his surety. I've already promised my father I'd be surety for him. And so let him go and take me instead. Don't you see Jesus on the cross saying, I promise my father I would be surety for them, for all of his elect. I will be surety for them. Crucify me and let these go. Remember, that's what Jesus said. Let these go. Jesus is our surety. He paid our sin debt. We have nothing to worry about. We have nothing to fear. Our sins have all been paid for and we have been redeemed by the death of Christ. We have a surety in heaven. Let me read it to you in the New Testament. Hebrews 7.22 By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. Jesus is our surety. Jesus on the cross became a surety for this sinner. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now these preachers today that are preaching that Jesus didn't accomplish anything on the cross except to make it possible for you to be saved by your own works and the, your repentance and your faith and all the things that they add to it. And certainly we believe in repentance and we believe in faith. But listen, those are not the foundational cause of your redemption. Those are accoutrements. Those are the fruits of your salvation. Those are the fruits of regeneration. The foundation of your salvation is when Jesus on the cross of Calvary redeemed you, bought you, 
purchased you and paid the redemptive price and became your surety. There is no way you could perish with Him as your surety, with your debt paid by Him. Oh, I get so disturbed when I hear these preachers who do not preach a redemption that's real, do not preach a debt that's actually paid, do not preach a surety that actually became a surety for the believing sinner. It's a hypothetical salvation they're preaching. It's a do-it-yourself salvation. Well, he set some things in motion for you, now it's up to you. You've got to do it all yourself. My friend, if, if my salvation depended upon me, I never would have had it. There's nothing I could do. I was lost, dead in trespasses and sins, blind, unbelieving. What could I do? What can a dead man do? Can a dead man help himself? No. Salvation has to be something God did for us. And it has to go back 2,000 years ago to the cross of Calvary. And there on that cross, He made a real, actual salvation and a redemption and a debt paid. And you can rest in that. That's where I rest today. Not in my faith or how much I believe. I rest in the foundational truth that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And if you don't get to that point, you'll never be saved. If you don't get to the point where your faith rests in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, you can't be saved unless you do. And if He died for you, you will come to believe that. I love this old time gospel. This is what our Baptist forefathers preached down through the ages. Today it's not being preached. Just a hypothetical atonement is being preached. A universal atonement that saves nobody, that helps nobody, that accomplishes nothing. But the atonement that Jesus made for His elect and for His people is an atonement that is real. Not hypothetical. It is genuine. It happened. Jesus died. Rose again. And there you have it. That's salvation. And when you rest in that finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you pass from death unto life. You'll be saved. Because He's already procured your salvation and laid the foundation for it. And you'll have it because He gave it to you. Limited atonement is proven by the fact that Scripture repeatedly qualifies those for whom Christ died. He died for His sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth His life for the sheep. So Jesus Himself limited the purpose of His death. He limited it to His church. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. There you have the atoning death of Christ, purchasing His church. It's limited thirdly to His people. Our text Matthew one twenty one: She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save His people from their sin. Here, His people are separated from the world. And then again, limited to the elect. Romans 8, 32. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Scriptures never extend the death of Christ to all men collectively. Never does. You'll never find a scripture that extends the death of Christ as an atonement to all men collectively. It doesn't do it in John 3.16. It doesn't do it anywhere else in the Bible. If Christ died for His sheep and for His friends, 
and for his church and his elect, then he did not die for all without exception. Every assertion, Mr. Hodge says, that Christ died for a people is a denial of the doctrine that he died equally for all men. It cannot be intended for all unless we say that Pharaoh and Judas were the sheep of Christ. The limited atonement is also seen in the use of the phrase many. Notice this word many. Now I believe the Holy Spirit knows the difference between all and many. And He chose to use the word many. Look at this. In the Old Testament as well as the New. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Now he could have said all if he meant all, but he didn't. For he shall bear their iniquities. Whose iniquities will he bear? Many. There will be many saved. We don't preach that Jesus is only going to save a handful. We believe a great multitude that no man could number are going to come into the kingdom of God. And they will be saved. But only His people have an atonement. Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man, Jesus said, came to give His life a ransom for many. He could have said all, but He didn't. Matthew 26, 28, the blood of the new covenant was shed for many for the remission of sins. He could have said all, but He said many. Hebrews 9, 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many. He could have said all, but He said many. Titus 2.14 Who gave Himself for us the redeemed. He could have said for them, but He said for us. The limited atonement is seen in the use of a personal plural pronoun used extensively in the Bible. Us and them. We and they. God distinguishes between His people his sheep, and the lost world. For instance, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8 God delivered His Son for us all. Romans 8.32 These references are to the called of Christ Jesus who are the saints in chapter 1 verse 7 and who are the elect in chapter 8 verse 33. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5.7 our Lord Jesus Christ gave Himself for our sins. Galatians 1.4, written to the churches. In Christ we have redemption through His blood. Ephesians 1.7, written to the chosen and predestinated in verse 4 and 5. Christ, His own self, bear our sins. 1 Peter 2.24, written to the elect in chapter 1 and verse 2. Christ loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Revelation 1.5 written to the churches. Verse 4. Be sure you're not reading somebody else's mail. You can read the Bible indiscriminately and get a wrong conclusion. You have to distinguish the us and the them. The we and the us and them and those. Those must be distinguished or else it makes no sense. Be sure that you don't read somebody else's mail and take scriptures that were not meant for you or leave out scriptures that were meant for you. In John 10, the great shepherd and his own, the shepherd calls his own in verse 3 of John 10. The shepherd leads his own he saves his own, verse 13 through 15. He knows his own, verse 4. The shepherd protects his own, verse 11 and 12. So he calls his own, he leads his own, he saves his own, he knows his own, he protects his own. Hmm. The limited atonement is proven also by Christ's intercessory priesthood. Now the thing that disturbs me is that most preachers and most theologians 
make almost no mention of the priesthood of Christ. They make a lot about Him being a Savior, but what they don't realize is that to be a Savior, He had to be a priest. He had to be a priest. Because in the Old Testament, only the priest could offer a sacrifice. And when Jesus offered a sacrifice of Himself to God, He was doing it as a priest. He was the antitype of the Old Testament typology of the priest. And in the Old Testament, the priest had to do two things when he made an atonement. Number one, he had to offer a blood sacrifice. He had to take the blood into the, into the holy place and place it upon the mercy seat. So he had to make an atonement. Secondly, he had to make intercession for Israel. And he never made intercession for the Philistines and the Moabites and the Hittites and the Jerusites. He never made an atonement for them. Never made a prayer for them. So he made no atonement for them. He made no intercession for them. And those are the two things that the priest has to do. And on the cross, Jesus died to make an atonement for us. And on the cross, He cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And He made an intercession for them. He did the two things that a priest has to do. He died for them. He interceded for them. And I want to show you that in just a moment. In Aaron did not offer a sacrifice for any except Israel. So the atonement in the Old Testament was limited. Limited to Israel. He never prayed for them. And he never made an atonement for them. In Isaiah 53 and verse 12, it describes the Messiah's ministry as a priest. Verse 11, For he shall bear their iniquities. That's his atonement as a priest. Do you know that nobody but a priest could offer an atonement? Mm. Nobody could go into the holy place with the blood but a, but a priest, the high priest. Jesus is our high priest. So in verse 11, He shall bear their iniquities. That's His atonement as a priest. Then in verse 12, He bear the sin of many. Not all. The sin of many. That's His atonement. Then in verse 12, it also says, And made intercession for the transgressors. As a priest, He made intercession. So there are the two things that Old Testament priests had to do and those are the two things that Jesus did on the cross and even before the cross. Notice as we turn to John 17, we will see who He made intercession for. Jesus is ready to go to the cross and die. And He's going to have to make intercession. Who is He going to make intercession for? Well, we're going to find that out in John 17. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to John 17. Who is Jesus going to make intercession for? And I'd like for you to look at verse 9. Who did Jesus pray for? I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine. I pray not for the world. You say, but in John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His Son. Doesn't that mean He made an atonement for everyone? Listen, that word world is the world of His people. The world of the elect. And that word all in the Bible that bothers so many people, do you know that it's almost invariably used in more than an individual sense. It is used oftentimes in many different ways. But let's get back to John 17 here. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. He's going to the cross now. Glorify Thy Son, that Thy Son may also glorify Thee, as Thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many. Did you catch that? To as many, not all, as Thou hast given Him. I pray for them 
Verse 9, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And I want you to notice that seven times in here, he says those that thou hast given me, and I'll read them quickly. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. See, he didn't give the world, out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. And then in verse 11, Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. And then in verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. Seven times Jesus said, thou gavest me. That's the elect. The elect were given, chosen of the Father, given to Christ before the foundation of the world. And Jesus came on a mission, and that mission was to die and make an atonement for the elect that the Father gave him before the foundation of the world. Hmm. That was his mission. He never came to save everybody. He never intended to save everybody. And he never said that he would save everybody. But he did say that he would lay his life down for his sheep. Now, Christ's atoning death and intercessory prayer work are the two aspects of his priesthood. Those are the two things that the priest had to do and the two things that Jesus did. The scope of one can be no wider than the other. So both are parts of the same priestly office. They must also be of the same extent. He only prays for those he dies for. Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, said he neither dies for them nor prays for them, speaking of the unsaved. He neither prays for them nor dies for them. And then I must hurry and close. Read Romans chapter 9. I don't have time to give it to you this morning. But if you read chapter 9 of the book of Romans, you will see there is no way that the atonement could have been, unli could have been unlimited. It was a limited atonement. I close with something J. Vernon McGee said. J. Vernon McGee is a radio preacher. He's in heaven now. And he was commenting on Psalms 11.5. And he said, but quoting Psalms 11.5, But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. And he said, God hates the wicked who hold on to their wickedness. He said, I don't think God loves the devil. I think God hates him, and he hates those that have no intention of turning to him. Frankly, he said, I do not like this distinction that I hear today, that God loves the sinner but hates his sin. That is not true. According to the Bible, God hates sinners, and he also loves sinners. But you have to distinguish whether they're elect sinners or non-elect sinners. And then he said, Until then, may I say, God is not a lovey-dovey, sentimental old gentleman from Georgia. This is hard truth to get across to people. People want to believe that Jesus died for everybody. But when they believe that, they're giving up the grounds of their atonement. How can I know if Jesus died for me? Peter said, Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Mm -hmm. That is, make sure that you've been called and elected. And there is a way you can do that. You say, how can I do that? It's certain that you do not know if the Father gave you to Christ in eternity past. But you can know that He did if you come to Christ. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you go back in your mind and heart to Calvary 2,000 years ago, and kneel before that old rugged cross, and look up into the dying face of Jesus, and say, Lord, I believe that you're dying here for me, 
and I trust you now and receive you as my Savior, then you will know that you were one of the elect that He died for. Mm -hmm. And you will know that your salvation was a real salvation. It was accomplished in Calvary's mm -hmm. cross and you have it today because He is a God who cannot lie. He does not break His promises and if you come to Him, He will surely receive you. He will not turn you away. That is His word. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. Let's bow together in prayer.